Fantastic to have you here, Kyle, today. Um, I think everybody's looking forward to the, this conversation. It's kind of interesting, actually, uh, while I'm a you know, CEO of a storage provider, also my background's been in asset management, so I can kind of put my ha uh, an investor hat on and, uh, and uh, experience you know, what marks um, businesses and, and the likes of Kyle. So um, it's kind of funny. It's sort of like uh, Colin Everin reached out and he said, hell, Kyle's, out. Kyle's actually gone positive. And I said, what, what do you mean he's gone positive? I said, he, he hates Filecoin. So maybe we'll start there and just uh, understand, <laughs> like, in, in the first... Uh, um, uh, what what uh, what was kind of driving that before you? you know, I know you went down, you did the deep dive at the end of last year, and you've come out with, uh, you know, uh, starting to you know getting on the front foot with the conversation um, um, around the ecosystem. Yeah, so you know, I got into crypto in 2016, uh, and time Ethereum is what pulled me in, and obviously IPFS was around, although fairly immature, and kind of obviously Filecoin sale happened in 17. I kept following and, you know, uh, kind of in the early days, I was looking, the Falcon paper came out, I believe it was in 18 or 19. Mm. And I remember reading it and I was just overwhelmed. I was confused, I thought it was, I was confused. And uh, my takeaway was it was way over engineered. And so I was like, all right, I'm just, I'm not gonna, not gonna really engage here. Um, around that same time, I learned about Arweave. Um, I learned about Arweave in, I think, early 19. And, uh, there was one thing I liked about Arweave, which was it was simple. It was pay once, store forever, and the way that you know the endowment worked. And it was it was it takes a little bit to understand the ideas, but the actual mechanics of the system were, were remarkably simple. Um, and so got excited about Arweave and, and ended up investing there. Um, I've since done a full 180 on both Filecoin and on Arweave, um, and kind of what I've observed over you know since call it early 19 through through now has been. The RWV ecosystem is really stagnated. They tried to make a push around smart contracts. Uh, they call it, I think, smart weave or, or something like that. I forget the name of it. And it doesn't appear that there's any real bites there. I don't fully appreciate why, but, but I don't think there's a lot happening. Um, and a lot of the big opportunities I think they had, uh, they, they've, they haven't capitalized on. Meanwhile, I look at Filecoin. And you know the, the scale on the storage side has become at this point a pretty pretty substantial number, um, and then at some point late last year I learned about the FEM, uh, and the FEM for me was a, kind of a light bulb moment. I heard of Bitcoin in 2011, 2012, and I thought it was dumb. Uh, it didn't speak to me mm -hmm. at all. Still think it's dumb. Um, and Ethereum is what pulled me into crypto because it's programmable. And when I saw the FEM, and I was like, oh, you can you know tie programmatic payments to real world uh, resource utilization, starting with storage and obviously eventually working towards retrieval markets uh, and compute markets over time. And that struck me as like a very important primitive. So I learned about it, I don't know, October, November of last year. And uh, I was, then I thought to myself, hey, Filecoin is two years old. Uh, and my kind of rule of thumb with blockchains is all, all blockchains do nothing in their first 12 months uh, other than make blocks. <laughs> Um, that's obviously a little bit facetious, but is actually like remarkably generally true. Um, and, uh, you know, it had been two years and I was like, okay, let's go check in. And I started to actually kind of see, you know, real people building. I learned about Lighthouse at that time, um, learned about a few other teams and started to say, okay, like the FVM, there's something here and digging in. And, and that's when I got, what got excited about Filecoin, uh, and then kind of made, made the full switch. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Great. So I suppose one of the um, uh, the other things that you've done for the space, you're starting to find this um, uh, deep end conversation, decentralized physical inf um, infrastructure, which is, you know, it's kind of like, for, you know, for me, it's kind of it's great to hear because, um, you know, one of the things, you know, when you, when you initially when I sort of started, you know. Uh, um, uh, thinking about uh, what one was actually proposing is like one mega transformation when you actually think about what the um, what the plan is for the network. And it's kind of interesting because we went down, we've actually done a series of data reports uh, to actually dimension this. And it's kind of like, I know Porter and others are talking about some of the data estimates uh, produced by IDC and others, but we think they're going to be absolutely blown out of the water. Um, when you kind of look at some of the numbers, it's kind of like, I think from, you know, we estimate, I think from 2010, we're generating like about one zettabyte of data a year. That early 2020s, we're doing like 100. We think when you look across the spectrum of, you know, IoT, um, EV, uh, and this is before really talking about, you know, uh, AI and journey of AI, et cetera, coming, that we're probably going to be in the, 
in the late uh, 2035, 20, 2040, like 75,000 zettabytes. If you kind of start to think about the movement from creation of data from human created data to um, essentially to uh, machine to machine created data, you start to understand how that could actually come about. But of course, the question then comes up then, Kyle, is like, how the hell are we going to fund all that? You kind of start thinking that essentially today is like, if you look at the, you know, the, as uh, Mark was pointing out, that whole, the, the digital infrastructure of this age run by those large companies, you know, there's probably a, we estimate like a couple of trillion bucks have gone into all that data infrastructure data infrastructure, data centres, connectivity, the whole lot. Um, and, and essentially, you kind of think, well, that represents about four zettabytes of kind of enterprise storage today. And we've got a forecast on the network to go to 1,000, so 250 times. So the question is kind of like, then you kind of go, well, how do we actually start? How's that conversation going to come about? And of course, is the, the deep in conversation starts to, you start to understand that. So I'd like to actually, Lee, I know you've talked about this a lot in other networks, sort of contrast and compare, and then think about it in the, in the Falkland context. Yeah, so um, you know, deep in stands for decentralized physical infrastructure networks. Um, I think there's kind of two major sub-components of that. There's, there's ones that are really network infrastructure, um, physical infrastructure, and I think kind of Helium is the poster child there. And there's some others now like Demo and Hive Mapper and some others in that bucket. And then there's the, uh, I think they're called DVINs or Decentralized Virtual Infrastructure Networks. Um, and Filecoin is, is one of the poster children there. Uh, I think the first DVIN to actually launch, I think is actually Live Peer. Um, and the Filecoin is, is one of the first. And there's Render now and IONet and a bunch of others focused on compute and, and all kinds of things. Um, what we love about these kinds of networks uh, is that they really map elegantly to crypto in a way that I think most uh, people who are not in crypto don't fully appreciate. Um, and that is that you need to, uh, a lot of these networks to be useful, you need a minimum threshold of scale before the system is useful. Um, so like if you think about F Filecoin, for example, if you have one storage provider on the network, like that, that the, the value of that network is not one ten thousandth of whatever Filecoin is worth right now. The value of that is worth zero because it's not large enough for anyone to care. Mm. Um, and so you need some minimum threshold scale for people to care. Or in the case of Helium, like if you have a network with 20 hot 20 nodes it, for a while this network, again, the value of that network is zero because it's not large enough for anyone to care. And what we love about crypto is it, it, it allows you to have this speculative capital uh, formation happen where people can say, look, I'm bought into this vision. Uh, I'm going to either buy some tokens or I'm gonna go buy some piece of hardware, whether it's a Helium hotspot or whether it's a server and, and set up a storage provider. And I'm gonna help build and contribute to this vision. And um, a lot of these things, you know, doing it, funding the, this, uh, this quantum of capital in a centralized way is, uh, it's, there's you know, very few examples in history where you have people who are, have that high of risk tolerance. Um, and in the case of something like Helium, it's the logistics of the decentralization is, is almost impossible. And so by allowing for this self-selection effect of people who want to deploy infrastructure and who have financial capital and want to contribute to the vision, um, it's really a beautiful mechanism to bring those two sides together. Um, the other thing we've, we've learned is uh, you can reward people for believing in the vision early. And so, uh, you know, if you're person number four who bought a Helium hotspot uh, and versus person number 400,000 that bought a Helium hotspot, very clearly person number four took on more risk than person 400,000 because when you're guy number four, you don't know if the network is actually gonna achieve the minimum threshold scale at which it would be useful. If you're number 400,000, you, you probably are already at that point. It's unclear where between four and 400,000 it is, but, but it actually kind of doesn't matter other than to understand that the risk is, is monotonically decreasing uh, decreasing as, uh, as the more nodes are, are there. And what that allows is, uh, depending on the exact algorithm for how the tokens are distributed, um, it allows the early participants to actually be compensated more, more handsomely for taking on that risk, believing in the vision um, before everyone else. Uh, and I find that to be a very elegant construct um, and so you get a, this very strong self-selection effect. The first people who bought Helium IoT miners in 2019 were following it in the crypto space, but those are you know, a few hundred people. Uh, and then actually the other community was IoT nerds. There's a whole bunch of people who work at different radio type companies and telecom companies all over the world. 
And they always kind of thought that was cool. And they were, you know, that first, most of the first five to 10,000 nodes were, were that community. Um, and they were self-selected into it. And I, I thought that was a very powerful concept. Um, and so I love this idea that if you believe in an idea early, you can put your money where your mouth is and contribute to the actual probability of success. And that, that, that's a very powerful uh, incentivization scheme uh, that really hasn't existed prior to crypto um, and is a very, very potent mechanism for tackling very large problem spaces. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because like coming from Australia, you know, we're a very resource-based economy and we've been you know, exposed to commodity markets and the actual efficiency and capital allocation that comes from having a commodity market in iron ore or coal or oil and suddenly we see for the first time we have that in data and it's probably one of the biggest attractions to me is that when I saw this you could actually see how the potential to fund this um, longer term as utilities actually proved out at the scale that we actually need because a lot of the numbers that surely presented even today like when I look at like Seagate or some of the players they don't they're not actually in a position to fund <laughs> to actually build out what we right. need and we need incentive mechanisms actually make that as you say and that looks like pretty pretty clear in that way I suppose the, the, the other thing is called you know we're all, you know uh, as Mark was alluding to in the, uh, in the um, his pitch you know there's a lot of craze about AI uh, at the moment and you know it's interesting and if I put my like equity market hat on just to see how you know much of a kick uh, chat GPT's had to some very, very large companies, and of course, NVIDIA. And I was kind of like, I'd like get your perspective on this. It was again, it's kind of like, are we, are, is it overhyped in, in the near term in that, in, in that, in that setting, in the Web2 setting today? It's like. Uh, the one word answer, in my opinion, is no. Um, the broad based consumer app is not clear beyond kind of chat assistant, uh, but there's a lot of vertical apps that are, are very quietly and quickly growing. Um, one of my favorite examples I heard of recently was uh, a lot of companies fill out RFPs. If you're selling government contracts, that's kind of standard. But a lot of enterprise software purchases run through the RFP process. Um, and if you've ever filled out an RFP, you know how excruciating that, that process is. Uh, the, the basics of filling out an RFP are read all of the documentation of your existing product suite of the company that you make, make the software, then read the questionnaire of the RFP, and then understand how to map basically the existing knowledge base of, of, from the documents to the questions being asked. And uh, that is what a chat, I mean, that's what ChatGPT basically does, right, is that. Um, and it, it sounds like it's a pretty small business process in the overall scheme of business processes that exist in the world, but it's one of the most economically relevant because the RFP is literally the like core thing in the sales funnel for whatever you're, mm. whatever you're trying to sell. Um, and so I, I, I haven't seen any data on you know, quality degradation of the chat GPT produced RFP versus the human produced one. Let's assume there's obviously some quality degradation there. Um, but if you can fill out 20 times the number of RFPs, like, I don't know, and reduce the human capital cost by a factor of 90%, like, that seems like a pretty good trade-off. Um, and there's all kinds of examples like that that people are, are unlocking in, in different, um, different, I think it's primarily internal business processes. Um, and those, are, those companies are growing very, very quickly. Probably the most high-profile one of those is called Harvey, which raised a bunch of money from Sequoia. Uh, I don't fully appreciate the business processes around what law firms do and, and how they're mm. using Harvey. But again, Harvey is not facing the clients of the law firms. Harvey is an internal tool for the, for the law firms. And so I think you're seeing an absolute ton of these. And I think the demand, come back to your original question of, is demand for, for uh, AI, you know, is there overhyped in the near term? I think those use cases are growing very rapidly today. Um, and I think those will continue to because the business cases are very clear. Um, we'll see if, when the, kind of the next major consumer thing hits. You know, Meta's about to roll out a ton of chat bots built into Instagram and WhatsApp and stuff. That's imminent. Um, Google is about to roll out, I think, some really aggressive stuff. Google is uh, both in, in Google Search as well as in Google Docs. <coughs> So we'll see how the uptake is on, on those, that, that's less clear. Uh, 
I do think the other big near-term consumer opportunity is travel. There's a real big opportunity to rethink uh, online travel agencies. Right now, you know, you go to Kayak or Google Flights or whatever, and you're like, yeah, flight from Austin to Las Vegas, and I pick a hotel. And like, what really you should be able to do is just type like, hey, I'm going to Vegas, these dates, I want to stay at this hotel. Uh, these are the kinds of shows I like. You know, like build, like give me the the package for all of that, and give me the options for different dates and times and shows and whatever. And that whole process of like iterative search, see what's available, think about it, the context of what you want, present it, understand the data, and then iterate through that between two and seven times, um, and then have a very explicit commercial intent at the end, like mega opportunity. Uh, I think we're going to see, you know. Uh, a, Travel agencies totally redefined in the pretty near future. There's a ton of people working on that problem. Um, so yeah, overall, I'm I'm like super excited about the about opportunity. That. And when you think about it in a Web three context, um, to contrast, where do you, where do you think like, in terms of the construct? Uh, yeah, I mean the 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 most important tie of all of that to, to crypto is uh, resource allocation. GPUs are in have been in short supply uh, for actually much longer than twelve months. Uh, the CTO of Microsoft is a guy named Kevin Scott. He's been CTO for roughly six years, five or six years. And he went on a podcast a few months ago, uh, and the guy asked him, hey, what's your biggest problem at Microsoft? And he says, my biggest problem is obviously GPUs today, but that's, that's been my biggest problem since I took the job five years ago. And I'd not expect him to say that. Um, and so uh, there's just a chronic GPU shortage everywhere in the world, uh, and I think that will persist. Uh, for quite some time. Uh, and the opportunity for crypto is to leverage latent hardware to do compute workloads. The, uh, the way most people, especially AI type of people, try and counteract that is they say, well, you know, not, certainly you can't do training on distributed compute. So, yeah, I agree, forget about training. I'm, I'm just referring to inference. But they say, you know, like the biggest models aren't going to run on consumer cards. They're only going to run on A100s or whatever. Um, and I, uh, Think that that frame uh, is it, the, back in the old days of search. Go back to like 1995, 1996, like pre-Google. Um, there was like very famous videos captured of people doing user testing on search, and the guy would type something in the search box, and the engineer who worked for like this is for um, uh, I've, Lycos and whatever else was around at the time, and the engineer would respond and say, "Oh no no no, you searched wrong." And like, if you think about the fundamental premise of what web search is, like you understand how, how deeply incorrect of a frame that that is. And I look at the current GPU shortage, uh, ML, uh, um, you know, found it, ML model problem in the same way, which is the machine learning guys like, oh, but the, the current model doesn't run on this hardware. And I'm like, okay, well, like the constraint is the hardware. So then like it's software, like tweak the software to make it work on the hardware. Like on what's available, otherwise your software is not going to run. Um, and like people seem to be forgetting that software is flexible, and like in a lot of cases you can reduce performance by five or ten percent, and you can reduce uh, 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 technical requirements by a factor of ten x. And so, like finding all of those opportunities for tweaking um, is how we're going to, and that, that's starting to happen now with Llama two being fully open sourced in the last what thirty to sixty days, uh, and we're going to see a huge proliferation of smaller models that are almost as good, but they can run on much, much smaller hardware sets. So we're really excited about uh, teams like IONet, who's here, and, and others that are all working in the space. Yeah, yeah, great, great. Um, in terms of like um, sort of explaining the Filecoin opportunity investment thesis, and usually I know just like you, you, when you sort of flip the switch, you decide, yeah, I'm. Um, I can see it now. Have this, and then the question is kind of like, how's your like that framework in terms of sort of like sort of explain to people how you see it um, playing out? Um, and you know, and always as an investor, I've tended to like you, you had you test things along the way. You want to see certain things happen, but if you could like, run us through the thought process, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think the arc of Filecoin will look similar to the arc of most other cryptos, which is the supply side gets built out first. Uh, and then the demand side kind of slowly catches up, and then at some point it's critical mass and, and takes off. Um, the first version time this happened was was Bitcoin mining. Um, 
Second time it happened was uh, Ethereum mining. Um, and we've seen now the versions of this with LivePeer and Filecoin and a bunch of other things. Um, and so I used to be concerned about the overbuilding of the supply side of these various networks. And uh, I've come to realize, like, seems to be OK. Um, there's, there's plenty of evidence to support that now. Um, and, and obviously today, Filecoin very definitively checks off the supply side of the network. So the big question in, in my mind is, how do we scale demand? Um, and uh, I, I think the most important thing for scaling demand is having applications that everyone understands are producing a lot of data every day and are sending that to Filecoin and retrieving it from Filecoin every day. Um, if you think about Amazon S3, you know, AWS, the first service on AWS was S3. I think it was even before EC2. Mm. Um, and that was 2005 or 2006. And um, you know, startups, the first customers of, of AWS were not big companies or universities, they were startups. Uh, and those startups started to grow. As the, the, their businesses grew, they started throwing more stuff in AWS. Um, and I think Filecoin needs to have kind of something similar. Uh, I'm optimistic teams like HiveMapper and other, other teams that, cap, that are capturing just tons of imagery and video data uh, will, be gra will gravitate to Filecoin for cost purposes. I think that's actually a pretty big draw if you're producing that much data. Um, and then those success stories need to be made public. So I think that's kind of the first step in, in un unlocking the demand side. Um, and then the second step is we need to have retrieval markets and all of that stuff be super, super fluid so that uh, you don't have to, quite frankly, think about storing or retrieving. Um, obviously, there's a lot of teams working on, on middleware. I know a bunch of teams here building all, all of that stuff. Um, but we're going to need uh, very robust uh, CDNs as well on, on top of all that to make it all really really flawless. And once those two things are there and those case studies are there, then I think you will see the like wave of, of, of Web2 uh, customers. Yeah, yeah fantastic. So if, um, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, you know, you've, uh, Moldicoin yourself, your, uh, uh, your co-founder has really kind of made a mark is that really independent thought process. That's the construed in droves. And the ability to have conviction um, throughout the cycle, whatever happens. And we're kind of at this testing point in time where it's kind of like you see in the whole ecosystem at the moment, you know, it's kind of like, and I know even my team, it's kind of like, you know, a little bit of gray hair helps in terms of just you know, settling, the, settling the ship and, and, and talking that way. I mean, could you kind of like share with everybody how, like, you know, in terms of, and it's always challenging as an investment manager at times, you know, when things actually go against you. In, in the near term around that, your conviction does get challenged, but how your framework and how you actually deal with that um, in terms of your approach. Um, I have a saying I say internally, and uh, I've been saying it for three or four years now, and every time I say it, it universally pisses off everyone on the team. Um, and that saying is, every disagreement we've ever had is a function of differing time horizons. Uh, it's an inherently uh, condescending statement because um, I'm always implying I'm on the long side and whoever I'm disagreeing with is on the short side. Um, uh, it's obviously not a perfectly true statement uh, given the audacity of the claim. It's a lot more true than you would think though given the ridiculousness of it on the surface. Um, and so you're using that frame to come back to your question. Um, yeah, in a bear market, it's really easy to be like, ah, oh, this shit doesn't work, and whatever, and kind of get, get tied, up, tied up in that negative, vicious cycle. Um, and then I think to myself, like, I really hate my bank, banks. I really hate everything around the financial system. I know, I, I know what the answer to all of those problems is. Like, it's crypto. Like, I, I, I very clearly, from first principles, can describe the solution. Uh, so stay the course and, and fight through. Yeah. So, uh, advice at this time in the? Uh, have a longer time horizon. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Kyle, look, look, 
we've um, really appreciated you actually being here today and um, you know it's kind of like that the thought leadership that's actually needed Thank you. in these things to actually kick things off is like um, I know that you know our company spent a lot of time doing education and uh, having more you know high conventional well-known investors uh, involved in the ecosystem uh, is, is, is wonderful and you know we'll be batting as hard as we can to actually make all this happen for uh, everybody at Multicoin and uh, the ecosystem as a whole. So we really appreciate your time here today. Hey, thank you, Heath, for this. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Super excited for the Filecoin. And yeah, let's, uh, let's make this thing happen. Cheers. Thank you.